to everybody um, as well. So we're going to kick off with the questions that have uh, already been sent in. Michaela, I hope you're ready for this. The first question comes from Fran. She says uh, she's approximately three years on from a diagnosis of P a triple PD. Uh, she's had a course of vestibular physio as well. She finds herself uh, having what she calls flare-ups. flare, flare -ups. These seem to be coming, becoming more frequent, especially at work. Um, she works in a busy retail environment and her wobbles, as she uh, calls them, are triggered by fast-moving customers and light refraction of mirrors, etc. I think a lot of us can relate to that. I'm also super sensitive to high windy conditions. Is there anything, uh, Michaela, you can suggest to help, please, as uh, she admits to being pretty frustrated and she doesn't know what to do next, what the next steps are, Michaela? So to start with, triple PD is, is quite a, a common diagnosis now, and it's connected with obviously the vestibular system, but also a, a strong anxiety response. It stands for persistent perceptual um, postural dizziness, um, and it's not necessarily fully originating from the vestibular system. That can be more the brain's response as to how it's perceiving movement um, and responding incorrectly. Now, there's a lot of factors involved in this question. There's things like how often the flare-ups are. If it's something that's very occasional, then it might be something that's different that's triggering things. Um, a lot of the things mentioned are related to complex visual environments where there's lots of things moving around. Now, a lot of people with vestibular issues have difficulty in complex visual environment because they over rely on visual information. So when things move, the eyes trip the brain and the brain doesn't know if the person themselves moved, if it's the person that walked past them, if it's both, and it's got to respond. So places like, um, as she mentioned, a retail environment where there's lots of lights, lots of people, that's a lot visually going on. So certainly that can cause difficulties with the balance. Also things like stress, if you're having a particularly bad day at work and there's lots going on, stress in itself can cause feelings of imbalance, tiredness, all sorts of other health issues can also add into the difficulties that cause a flare up. So it depends on all these different factors as to what is going on and therefore what the advice would be um, to seeking suitable help as to establishing what these different factors might be and being able to tackle each of those threads will make a big difference. So yeah, looking at is there stress elements involved? Are there other health issues? going on um vestibular rehab wise depends on on what exercises they're doing or or what what they're needing to do from there so having a chat to someone to help them identify all these different triggers and then tackling those will be the way to go all right friend i hope that helps um thank you all for joining i believe we've got around 52 members uh in the group this afternoon which is Pretty amazing. So, Michaela, you've you've got a lot to live up to. No pressure. Uh, we've got the next question from Judy. Can I just ask before I go on to the next question, can everybody hear us uh, okay? Because I think one or two people are having problems yet. Yeah. Everyone can hear us okay? Great stuff. Okay, so I'm going to move on to Judy's question. And Judy's question is, uh, does hypnotherapy help with fear, anxiety and dread of a possible attack when out? Again, something I think a lot of us can relate to. Certainly it can do. Um, hypnotherapy is can be very, very helpful in kind of helping reduce the emotional response to something um, when appropriate. Hypnotherapy is very much one of these things that you need to kind of be on board with it, open to the, the possibility of it being helpful and also seeing somebody that you connect with quite well, that you can relax with and, and talk to. Um, all sorts of mindfulness will help with this kind of situation as well. So finding the thing that helps your brain just tune out from everything else that's going on around you and just focusing in on something that you enjoy. So some people find things like listening to audio books can help them tune out from what's going on around them. Um, a whole variety of different breathing techniques. And I know from previous meetings, you've had some people talking people through 
different breathing techniques that could be really helpful. So that's well worth looking back through previous meetings with regards to that. Um, sports, playing music, um, things like Tai Chi, yoga, Pilates, fantastic for mindfulness, fantastic physically, fantastic for balance because it's very gentle, repetitive body movements. And it's really good mentally. So it ticks a lot of boxes. Again, it's finding the right one that suits you, that helps your brain just focus in on just what you're doing in that moment and not focused on the, but what if this happens or what if that happens and all of these kind of circumstances that we all find ourselves in. Thank you, Michaela. Worth trying then, Judy. Hopefully uh, you caught all of that because I know you're uh, listening on the phone. We're going to move on to Barbara's question. Uh, and Barbara says, I've been diagnosed with bilateral meniers, uh, many years. Uh, currently, I have short spins, which are fortunately only lasting a couple of minutes, but are followed by an extended period, a period of imbalance, which can last 24 hours or more. Then I can be absolutely fine for the next few days. Sometimes the imbalance seems to suddenly switch on without a spin. It doesn't seem to be affected by the same things as in the past, so things like the supermarket, the railings, the bending over, uh, scrolling on computer. She believes that um, she's been told that vestibular rehab exercises such as head shaking and nodding won't help these particular spins. So will they help the uh, related imbalance? Um, she says, I can do the basic exercises I've been given without feeling any worse. On the other hand, uh, the imbalance isn't improving. So the, the short answer to that is that is absolutely correct. The vestibular rehab, rehab exercises won't help Meniere's attacks. It won't do anything to prevent them. It won't do anything to stop them when they're happening. But the rehab exercises will really help with retuning the function of the balance system in between those attacks. Now, with the exercises, they do need to be adjusted as vestibular function adjusts. So it wouldn't just be a case of you being given just one set of exercises and that's going to sort it out completely forevermore or in between each one because things will vary. So the exercises will need to vary. The many as attacks themselves would need suitable treatment by the doctors. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, the next question comes from Andrea, and it's quite a long one. Um, she she talks about the fact that she has lost hearing completely uh, in her right ear, right ear, but that no lasting damage. Um, she's been getting better and better since October when she started using HRT patches. Uh, she says she's been able to start uh, adding walking back into her routine and doing more in her week and still feeling okay uh, up until a point where she went to a, a function she was doing really well and she's been going downhill since then she felt drunk so one day she feels uh, really unwell uh, and dizzy and uh, the following few days she may be okay and then back to feeling unwell and I think a lot of us um, feel like this and have felt like this lots of uh, environments like uh, you know the, the, that have a lot of noise and stimulants they can affect her, obviously. Why, though, she's asking, after a long period of uh, doing so well and building up her daily routine, uh, has it all come crashing down again? We've got to remember there's lots of outside factors that influence how people feel with balance as a whole. The balance system isn't purely just vestibular systems, the inner ear balance. Balance is also made up of our visual information. So not necessarily how well we see, but what's going on within our visual environment. It's dependent on our full muscular uh, skeletal system and what our brain is then able to deal with all of those inputs, how it processes it, how it sends out responses and everything responding accordingly. Outside factors such as stress levels, tiredness, feeling unwell in any way, any other health issues that are adding in all of these will have an impact on how people feel with balance. So even with completely normal vestibular systems that have never been upset about anything, having something like a cold will make anybody feel off balance. That's not anything to do with the vestibular system. It's your brain's busy trying to deal with other things. Now, 
it's worth bearing those things in mind because having had a vestibular issue it's very normal for if you have some kind of dizziness with something else to suddenly get that oh god my balance is bad again my vestibular system's playing up and it might not necessarily actually be the vestibular system itself so where possible try and take that consideration of, am i unwell with something else am i particularly stressed at the moment am i not sleeping very well for whatever reason the other things to consider is that it's very very easy that if you're getting good spells and bad spells that on the good spells think right i'm going to do all the things that i've not had a chance to do because i've not felt well enough so i'm going to try and get everything done now while i can <laughs> which again we all do these things yeah. but the difficulty is that you run the risk of overstimulating an already stressed brain it's trying to deal with lots already with trying to keep on top of things with your balance but it's already working very very hard we overstimulate it which means we then overwhelm it until it can't cope with any of it which will then mean you will have a bad spell i cannot stress enough the importance of pacing yourself even when you're in a good spell don't try and do everything do a little bit of something and then give yourself a little bit of break let your brain just catch up and recuperate and then it can do the next thing and then give it a bit of a break come back and do something else if you just keep going and going and going and going it will get more and more and more tired make things more and more difficult and you're not doing yourself any favors and pacing ourselves also applies to anybody that doesn't have vestibular issues we all rush around too much but we're not made for it so we get more done if we pace ourselves as well as keeping active so a very long answer to probably one that could have been shorter but yeah pace That's good. michaela can i just add my experience i'm um with many years i had never experienced what i call an illness or a health condition before that didn't start I'd let, take the example of I break a, break my leg. The start of the condition is quite severe, and then it's it's very easy to understand how that slowly gets better and mends. And it, you tend not to overstress a broken leg, and it gets better and better and better until it's fixed. And what used to play with me mental head games was discovering I could have this condition that doesn't behave like that. It, it can be extremely bad one week and then great the next and then go back again. And, and that, I think, is so difficult when you've never experienced anything like that before in your whole life. You expect things to get better in, in kind of a linear way. And, and it took me a couple of years to start getting that around my head. And, and we've referred to it in the past where I call it snakes and ladders. Yeah. I used to think I was doing so well, I've gone for a few weeks, or I've gone for a few months, and then bang, I have a really bad vertigo attack. And, and it was not just the physical, it was the mental disappointment of, oh my God, I'm back to square one. And all this time thinking I was getting better, I was just fooling myself. For me, the answer was to acknowledge that was part of a balance condition and not let it bother me. I just expect these snakes and ladder twists. But I just want to mention that from the perspective of suffering, that until I got this condition, I thought any health condition started very badly and got better in a, an even way. But the good news is a lot of balanced conditions do get better. I've got so much better, but it definitely isn't linear. Uh, and you have to almost hold on for the ride. And, and it is, as you mentioned, there are so many factors that then tip us over the edge. But um, the, the, the answer to it definitely for me was accepting this is normal. Yeah. And then it, then it was less disappointing when it happened. And the uh, thing is, when you when you have a, a what I would call a blip in things, when you have a slightly worse spell, 
that doesn't mean you're going back to square one. You haven't lost all the progress that you've made. You're having a blip. You're having a bit of a bad match. Yeah. But you've still made the gains that you've made. There's yeah. just still more work to do. Yeah, absolutely. And and 20 years on, I can now tell you it's a lot harder for me to maintain a healthy body weight and look after my balance system. That one keeps flipping. <laughs> <laughs> And lots of people relating to everything that has just been said. Lots of nods, lots of comments as well. Kelly, I think, uh, on the chat uh, as well, isn't there? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing. Uh, we're going to move on to the next question, and this one comes from Judith. I have a BBPV, a triple PD, and early onset of many years. Sometimes because of feeling very off balance and unsteady, I am reluctant to go outside to uh, walk on my own. 71 years old and expect cataract surgery as well on both eyes in the near future, uh, most likely this year. So also my vision is going to be affected adversely until both eyes are corrected. Really struggling to concentrate on staying safe whilst out and about, especially with things like crossing, a tra uh, crossing traffic lights and, and the motion of traffic on busy roads. I am now considering purchasing a walking aid, aid uh, a rollator for outdoor use. Uh, please, can you ask Michaela's opinion on this and any tips or advice she can offer? And I, Judith, can wholeheartedly relate to this because I, 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 you know, remember sort of even now struggling to walk across a really busy road with lots and lots of traffic. Um, you know, the fear is real. But Michaela, hopefully you can give us some good, good advice. Basically, I'm all for anything that helps you keep as active and as mobile as you safely can. The important thing is keeping as active and as mobile as you can. The worst thing that you can do is basically hold yourself up in your house, in your armchair, not moving, because that's going to introduce more problems or start causing problems with muscle wastage, which will then mean you're not quite as strong and not as able to move around as you were. So absolutely. If the only way you're able to get out safely and with confidence is to use a walking stick or a um, rollator, so the, the three or the four wheel kind of um, wheelers, then yeah, absolutely, all for that. And keep as active as you can. We can then look at improving mobility potentially without the walking aid as we progress, hopefully with the treatment of the of the balance issues but yeah certainly when you're introducing visual difficulties from things like cataracts as well yeah anything that you can do that keeps you secure absolutely all for that i felt really silly because i started using a walking stick and thought everyone's going to laugh at me because i haven't got you know i haven't got a broken leg i haven't got walking difficulties as such that are obvious and for years i i spent a lot of my time just worrying about what other people thought uh was going on and people taking the mickey out of me and laughing at me uh and and some people blatantly you know saying stuff to me going oh, what are you doing with with a walking stick but actually it's it's been you know talking to people like you michaela and being part of this group made me realize actually it doesn't matter what other people think if if it helps you and it it really has done and it you know i don't i don't need to use the walking stick now um but for a long time i did and if it helps me then absolutely do it is i would say that and that's you know I, it's something that i've done and still do i still carry my my walking stick is in the car if i feel like i'm a little bit dodgy i'm going to take it out with me if I, if i feel um like i need it um, I'm going to move on to the next question. This is uh, from Anonymous. I've watched several past group meeting uh, video recordings. Uh, many times people refer to the importance of gaining control of our mind and having mental ability to cope with our physical balance symptoms. How do I do this or achieve this or practice to achieve this as I feel totally at the mercy of my symptoms every day and that weakens my mental strength so much, Michaela? I mean, there's a whole range of different ways and it's finding what works for you. Firstly, this support group is fantastic. It's really, really wonderful for being able to see that other people experience the same things that
that you experience that you're not alone in what you're going through and also the supportive nature of this group and i've said to to people before that previously i'd always been a little bit worried about some support groups that there can be a lot of negativity but it's wonderful to find a support group such as this that kevin's been so good at setting up in such a supportive manner being able to speak to other people um, and get that reassurance and also the resources on the on this group is just fantastic um if needs be speaking to your gp potentially for things like antidepressants for potentially a short period of time just to help you get through the more challenging time there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever or whether it's needed for longer term that's no problem at all but there's also a whole variety of different talking therapies um different kinds of counseling a whole variety of anxiety management techniques stress management techniques and again things like mindfulness will really really benefit being able to get your brain to have something different to focus on really helps and try and find something that you enjoy doing in whatever way you enjoy doing it and making sure you do that every day it's very easy if there's something wrong to kind of put all your time and effort and focus in trying to deal with it to make it better the problem with that is if you're spending all your time focused in on doing that it means you've kind of shut out other things that are potentially nice so still do something you enjoy every day in whatever way you can whether it's sitting with a book whether it's sitting and, and chatting to a friend certain tv programs whatever it is that you enjoy doing keep doing it but if needs be speak to someone that can help you find different techniques to try and be open to trying different things you will find some things that somebody says oh this is fantastic that you do and think that's really not for me and that's fine eventually you'll find something that you do that actually really helps but you will only find it if you try different things so the support is there keep looking keep asking and keep trying different things till you find what works for you but it will but Kara, if I just add, and again, I, all I can do is go on personal experience. I I was as bad as anyone when I first started on my experience with a balanced condition. Um, I didn't know, literally, I didn't know which way was up. It was panic. It was grief. It was, is my life over and all of that. The bit I found with the, the mental side is it's like anything, you you need time to adjust and practice and improve. And for example, I, I spent the first two, three years, every moment of my waking life, monitoring everything I was doing. Um, and that is so exhausting. For me, it turned out to be completely pointless. I, I didn't achieve anything other than remind myself every minute of the day, I'd got something wrong with me. So, so it was kind of self-feating. To, to be constantly doing that. However, it's quite normal when something's very new. Of course, it's on your mind. And un unlike my broken leg analogy, where if I'm sitting or lying down, I can forget about it. When, when things are waving through your brain and every time you move slightly or look at a screen or look at things, you get these weird sensations. It's really difficult to put that out. But the one, the one thing I... And sure, everyone, it's a bit like if you've not been doing a lot of walking and you start walking again, you do get better at it. And it's the same with this mental approach of learning. You can begin to cope more and more with the, the pressures, the anxieties, the challenges. But it takes time and it takes practice. But hopefully that's where such as this group helps people to understand you do get better in how you can control control the way you react. You can't possibly control the symptoms, but you can begin to control how you react to things. But it's definitely time um, for, for me to learn. And all those things you've said, seeking 
um, whether it's cognitive treatment therapy or e even medication, but it's trying to get this space where you can begin to, to get better at, at coping yourself. It's really difficult because it's inside you. And, you know, we've all, we've all had that classic where everyone goes, pull yourself together. And yes, I would if I was a pair of curtains, but I'm not. So it's, you know, it is difficult. But thanks. I'm, I'm off again. Sorry. He is. He is. I told you. Told Bye -bye. you. <laughs> yeah. But it is, you're right. It is time. It is patience with yourself. And I think it's being kind to yourself as well. Absolutely. And not being so hard. It's, you know, and I think I've learned that from Michaela because she's just genuinely amazing and patient. Um, she has taught me that, you know, that that is one of the biggest things I think she's taught me is being kind to yourself and being patient with yourself. It really, really does make a difference and not being so, you know, kind of like, why can't I do this now? Why can't I do X, Y and Z? Um, loads of comments, Kelly, uh, as well. Can we go through some of them, please? Yeah, absolutely. So lots of people are kind of sharing tips and things in terms of like what helps them and what kind of challenges they're facing. So we've had comments about how the mental challenges and the associated anxiety can be sometimes more debilitating than the actual symptoms, so the attacks on um, BM or many years. Um, and the, Simon's put that the attacks are horrible but time-bound, whereas the snakes and ladders is permanent. So I think that's a, a really I think that's a really good point and I can definitely relate to that. Got some more shout outs for the poll, like yourself, RuPaul, and having people use that in the bag. Um, if they're having a bit, gives them the confidence. For me, if you've ever seen me out and about or on these meetings, mine is my woolly hat. I will wear that woolly hat. Doesn't matter if it's 30 degrees outside. That woolly hat, if I'm having a bad day, is my like little thing. Um, and you, you do just get used to people just going, why have you got a woolly hat? And I'm like, it's got nothing to do with the weather. Of course it's not when it's hot. Um, but yeah, that for me, that helps with um, keeping me sane and my confidence when I'm out and about from the blip. Um, what else have we got in here? I've got some questions which we'll come back to at some point um, later on. And um, we've got walking, cycling as some options that people have tried um, to help um, in their situations. There was talk of, again, I think Pilates, yoga, body balance. That's a, a class that I do when I can um, and well enough that I find really helpful, which is like Pilates, Tai Chi and yoga. Um, what else have we got in here? Yeah, more shout outs for exercise. Again, it's just that build up, isn't it? In terms of you'll have days where the last thing you want to be doing is exercise. But equally, if you can just do something small and then build it up over time, you, you know, that can improve. Um, and then, yeah, I think just got some more questions when we're ready for those. But other yeah. than that, we've got a few good few more questions that uh, have already come in so we'll get through those first mm. if that's okay yeah um, of thanks kelly julia has got a question she says uh, i've got a diagnosis of bilateral vestibular hypofunction and triple pd despite trying to keep as active as possible and various rounds of rehab and some well-known specialists my condition continues to worsen and has done for the last five years any ideas why this might happen and what i can do now um that I have got so debilitated and that uh, practice is becoming an impossibility. So again, that brings us kind of back to the whole variety of outside factors that influence how people feel with their balance as a whole. So again, that's stresses, tiredness, any other health issues, anything else going on with your body. So for example, if you put your back out, and you're in pain, the pain will make you feel worse with your balance, but you're also going to be moving differently, which will have an impact on how you how your balance is. Um, this it's difficult to to say kind of without kind of really being able to sit down and, and talk through everything as I would would normally. Um, but again, it's it's things like showing yourself that same kindness that you would show to other people if they were experiencing what you're experiencing. We're always so much harder on ourselves and expect so much more of ourselves than we would of a loved one if they were having the same difficulties. So showing yourself that same kindness, letting yourself have a bad day and say, it's okay to have a bad day because I'm having a bad day. Does it make the badness okay, but you've got to give yourself a break that that these things happen, unfortunately. Um, 
things like Kevin mentioned, I think, about acceptance therapy and that, that acceptance of having to deal with a chronic health issue um, and kind of your the mindset approach to dealing with it. And we can do a lot of work with improving vestibular function. But the, the stats on it essentially say that we will get 80% of people better. That does leave a small number of people that, although we may make improvements for, we might not get things to as they were before. And then it's, it is that case of trying to deal with things as best as we can and making things as good as we can and enjoying things wherever we can. So, yeah, keeping active, keeping mobile, doing the things you enjoy. It's so, so important to stress. Keep doing something that you enjoy doing. Thank you, um, Michaela. Sandy asks, my neurologist retired two years ago. He and his nurse uh, practitioner told me that there was nothing they could do for me because the medications I tried weren't successful. Um, they had also, no, uh, they said they'd got no one else to take over the practice or no one else to refer um, Sandy to. Do you think that she should, uh, he or she, um, um should try and find somebody else, which could be a bit of a challenge for a follow up follow up visit, or maybe, um, you know, uh, some other useful knowledge on how to treat brain spinning. Uh, Sandy says, I did go for PT specialists, but they stopped treating me because they didn't believe that I had vestibular neuro uh, neuritis because I was doing exercises that someone with vesti vestibular neuritis would not be able to do. So um, feeling in a bit of a catch-22 situation with that. And also um, since uh, Sandy has head tremors as well. I would certainly say yes. Seek someone else to to speak to and to see what else can potentially be done. In the meantime, I'm sorry, in the meantime, I have had um, a contact with a neurologist, not a neuro-otologist. Okay. Um, and I made an appointment for next month. And I made sure that he treats vestibular neuritis because Fantastic. I'm not even sure I have that because I get... Now, Dr. Ray says because of my brain spinning is what makes me sick. So when you say you have to go do, you have to get out, you have to keep doing, I'm too sick to get that done. And my BMI is nil to none at this point. Um, but there's just, I, I'm, I've been in bed for like the last four days. And today I'm at this meeting, yay, yay. Uh, but I'm just wondering if there's something else going on besides having been diagnosed with the VM because of the way I feel so sick. I'm not sick when I'm sitting or lying, but as soon as I get up, nothing's spinning, but I'm just so out of it. Like, I can't even compare it to being drunk. Um, I've, I've read lately about the mushroom thing, which I've read about, but it's very, A, it's scary, and B, it's, it's, you have to really know what you're doing with that. Um, I smoke pot, which makes me feel... Hi, but as soon as I get up, I'm even more out of it because I'm high. Yeah, but it certainly. makes me feel a little better. Yeah, certainly, it's it's really important to see somebody that's the suitable um, speciality to help you. That's Please don't think it's a case of saying of me saying you've got to get out and keep doing all the things that you would previously have done it's always a case of keep as active and as mobile as you can so even if it's just you're lying in bed and just moving your head a little bit if that's all you're able to do it's important to do that when you can 
but yeah absolutely seeking the advice of a suitable specialist is well essential for brilliant. anyone with, a, with a, any kind of balance issue yeah that's brilliant thank All you right. Sunday, okay. good luck, good luck. Uh, I'm going to move on because we've got a few more questions to uh, to to get through. This one is uh, no name. My husband thinks, <laughs> and I can totally relate to this one too. My husband thinks that joining a support group and talking about my balance condition may trigger more problems with my balance, as it will be more on my mind. I know he's wrong, but how do I explain that to him? And could there be any truth that uh, the more I think about my balance, the more I may suffer from bad balance? I'm going to question. <laughs> I'm going to sit here and, and happily tell you that you are both correct. Your husband is absolutely right that if you are spending all day, every day focused on what's going on with the balance and how you're feeling and is my balance feeling bad at the moment is it bad if i do this then yes you will feel off balance because your stress levels will be up and the stress will make you feel dizzy anyway and with regards to as i mentioned before about support groups there are support groups in any kind of health issue or um well anything that you can think of there are groups that if you participate in particular ones that are very, very um, negative, trying to think of how, how best to word this to, to still be diplomatic, that there are often people that can be very, very keen to tell the world how awful everything is for them and that try to make everybody feel as bad as they feel in whatever way. The good support groups, thank you very much, Kevin, for, for this one, do exactly what it says on the tin, they support. It's the acknowledgement of, yes, what you're going through is unpleasant. There's a lot of negatives to it, but there is hope and there is help there. And that needs to be the focus, the support and that hope and that help. So you're both right in in with um, regards to views on support groups. I, I'm absolutely on both sides of the fence on that one, I'm afraid. Um, um, Michael Michaela, as as it's just you and Rupal here and no one else, I, I can confess, as I was starting, looking to start the support group five years ago, what went through my mind? Oh my goodness, if I start doing this, will I get more balance attacks? So completely irrational but for some reason that's how our minds work i i've had people inquire about joining the group saying they're worried if they join the group it might trigger more now all i can say is after five years it's definitely not caused me more balance issues whatsoever being involved with the group but honestly before i started it one thing flashed through my mind will this somehow trigger some some psychological trigger of more balance and it doesn't definitely but it's normal to worry about it it is but again it's that it's the type of environment as to whether it's causing you further stress or whether it's providing you support yeah and that's the biggest difference if you're going into a support group and you're coming away more stressed because everybody's been telling you how awful everything is and nothing's going to get better and it's all going to get worse from here and then that's not a support group yeah. if you're going away with thinking okay i can try this technique or i can try that or I, I can look in this direction for help fantastic yeah brilliant yeah bit of both yeah yeah thank you uh one final question that uh, was sent in my balance condition i think you've kind of answered this in some respects uh, my balance condition varies in strength from day to day sometimes very mild other times so overpowering i don't move what's your guidance when it uh, comes to uh, you know a good time or most productive time to practice walking moving or any sort of uh, rehab exercises please so with regards to things like your vestibular rehab exercises little and often is the key if you only do them when you're feeling good 
then that's not going to be of much benefit. Equally, if you really hammer at it when you're feeling really awful, it's just going to make you feel worse and make you more likely to not do the exercises often enough that they need to be done. So little and often. And it's the idea of the exercises shouldn't be that you do them where you're feeling or the, to the point that it's making you feel awful. The idea of the vestibular rehab exercises is to stimulate balance function, to give your brain the chance to work out what's going on and start to adjust for it. So we need to stimulate it a little bit, but then we also need to let it kind of process that, that information and relax. So, yeah, with regards to the exercises, listen off. With general activity, again, pacing yourself. This isn't a case of, right, when you get up first thing in the morning, get all your jobs done because you're going to feel awful in the afternoon because you will fall off in the afternoon because you've done everything in the morning. Try and spread it out. You don't have to do everything all at once because that's the only opportunity you're going to have if you space it out. So, yeah, pacing yourself in whatever way works for you. And actually, if it takes you quite a while to get going in the morning, that's fine. Give yourself that space to take that time and do a few bits a bit later on. If you're better in the morning, generally, then do a few bits in the morning and give yourself a break a bit later and just try and spread it out. And you don't need to do the whole week's worth of ironing all in one go. <laughs> the biggest one people come to me with, I spent a whole, whole hour or two doing whole weeks of ironing and I feel awful and I couldn't do anything else for the rest of the day. Yeah. <sighs> Nobody needs to iron. Oh, absolutely true. Thank you. Um, Kelly, I think we've got another question that uh, we have received as well from yeah, there's the email. A, a few little bits and pieces that are in the chat box in terms of questions for you, Michaela. So I'll just start mopping up some of those if that's all right with you. Okay, so from Simon, he's put, do you think that GPs know enough about balance illnesses to prescribe things like yoga, tai chi, vestibular physio as an alternative to drugs? And do any of our contacts in the Leicestershire NHS, NHS have any ability to influence this? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult. Mm. <laughs> The GPs are in a really difficult position. Yeah. They've got to know a little bit about such a wide variety of things. And they've got to be really vigilant for things that are potentially life-threatening and, and these kinds of things, which I say unfortunately vestibular is not. It's not unfortunate that vestibular is not life-threatening, but it kind of doesn't put it way up on the priority list of we've really got to urgently work on this as such so yeah gps are hugely variable as to what their particular interests are and finding a gp with an interest in vestibular issues i think there's probably not that many in comparison to other health issues but they are about um uh, yeah, they're in a position where they're looking at treating things medically. Um, obviously, things like Tai Chi yoga, that's not a medical intervention. Um, so that's probably not something that they, they would point you towards. Um, but hopefully they would point you towards somebody doing vestibular rehab. And I think most of us would be very, very enthusiastic to encourage that kind of practice um yeah the gps are in a difficult position mm. i have the the advantage where i get to know a huge amount about a very very small topic yeah, yeah michaela can i just ask because the last time i saw you and i'm not trying to put you in any difficult situation but were you not saying something about you know certainly within um, the balance clinic here in Leicester that they were planning to look at trying to introduce you know things like hypnotherapy and then perhaps some other things or did I have I am I mistaken I mean yes that's correct but it, again it kind of is 
dependent on the particular interest and speciality of the staff that are working within okay. those clinics. Um, Leicester, we have the advantage that there are members of staff that are very, very enthusiastic and keen to bring these things in and kind of widen the help that we provide beyond purely just these are the exercises and, and we don't deal with any other aspect of vestibular uh, difficulties. It is, I think, getting probably better generally wide, more widely, um, but it is more acknowledged that vestibular issues aren't just a case of dealing with the vestibular mm. ear part. It is also actually dealing with all the anxiety and all the other issues that come along with it. But it's it's dependent on the individual that you see, I think, unfortunately. Yeah. I hope that's changing. Yeah. Thank you for that, Michaela. Um, next up, we've got one from Claire, and she's put that she has um, vestibular migraine, I think is what BM stands for. Um, it's reduced from daily attacks to two to three days a week with CGRP. I'm not sure what those initials mean, so hopefully you do, or Claire might be able to let us know in the chat. Um, but she's put, she has significant visual issues, exhaustion, and triggers very easily. She was discharged from VRT and as even very gentle exercises triggered more migraines. She walks around the block each day, but if she tries to go in a shop or other busy areas, she starts migraining within minutes and it can last for days. Um, what else can she do to stay active, please? It's finding the activity that doesn't trigger the migraines. So whether it's, I don't know, walking in environments that are less visually complex. I mean, things like walking through shopping centres would just be horrific for it. Um, walking potentially in somewhere like um, a park when there's not loads of kids running around or um, more sort of dog walking area type environments might be more beneficial for her. It might be, I don't know, kind of gym environments where she's able to go on a treadmill or a, um, a bike without lots of other things around her dependent on the, the setup of the gym it's going to be a case of trying to find the different things that help her and again things like tai chi yoga pilates trying different types of those because some might be suitable some might not be but there's yeah there's not a nice easy one single answer to that it's very much trial and error for each individual fab thank you for some of those suggestions michael and hopefully we can try to take some of those forward okay next up there's a question from wendy she's put that she's post-surgery for acoustic neuroma with ssd and vestibular, is vestibular issues that are slowly improving um, but she does also have oscillopsia, which is like being in a film um, of the Blair Witch Project. Well, that sounds awful. Um, does this ever write itself or is there something that she can do to help improve it? So certainly we'd be looking at vestibular rehab exercises to try and get things retuned as best as we can. There's no way of being able to say how good we could get that. But... I wouldn't have any hesitation to say we could probably get things a bit better than they are. The the oscillopsia is a slightly different thing. That's the where the vision is bobbing as you move. That may or may not improve, but the only way we, we know is by trying. Thank you for that one. Uh, next up, we've got a question from Rosie. She's put that as well as the imbalance in between MD attacks, she also has real trouble with her eyes a lot of the time. They struggle to keep still and have she has to fight to stop them flicking around all the time, which can be really exhausting. Um, she doesn't hear of many other people complaining of this symptom between attacks. Is it normal? And are there any vestibular exercises that you could suggest to help her with the eyes as well as the balance? That would be something that I would be recommending getting further assessment on. 
yeah, seeing a, a suitable, suitable specialist to have a look at that, to see whether it's vestibular related, whether it's a, a visual thing, whether it's, it's something else going on. That needs, I would be pointing her in the direction of one of the doctors to have that further investigated to, to check what's happening. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Okay, so I've had another couple of questions come in. Um, so bear with me, Michaela, you're doing grand. Um, so this one is from Angela, and she's put that her 16-year-old daughter has suffered from a balance condition since November 22. Um, the diagnosis has been no more specific than vestibular dysfunction. And while she's much better than she was at the start, in the last six months, she's plateaued. She can do several... Um, sort of say six to ten weeks basically functioning but has periods of up to a week at a time where she is back to square one and barely able to leave the house or sometimes even her bed what can she do to help reduce the length of sever length and severity of her bad episodes firstly i'll be seeking a, a more definitive diagnosis mm -hmm. to exactly what's going on there Yes, I'm trying um, trying to do that. It's just working the way through the, the NHS and then perhaps resorting to um, digging into the savings and, you know, just to, it's hard to know what the next step is, I think, to, yeah. to get the diagnosis. Fine, seeing if you're able to get a, a referral to someone that their speciality is vestibular issues there's it's very easy to get referred into general ENT because vestibular issues are an ear problem but not all ENT doctors have their speciality or interest in vestibular issues um in that case things can start to take a lot longer to get a, a decent diagnosis or you kind of get passed around to get all the different tests that may or may not show them what they're, they're looking for and you kind of get passed on to somebody else to have a chat to and see if they can suggest anything seeing someone that specializes in vestibular issues cuts out all of that kind of nonsense it just you you need to see someone that that's what their thing is is can there I a sorry carry on I know it's an awful lot easier said than done. <laughs> is there a list of such people? If the so, doctor, yeah, sorry. Is there a list of such people if the doctor doesn't have that? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm really hesitant to say Google vestibular specialist in <laughs> in, your, in your area, but when there's there, yeah, there there are some that you can find quite easily. Um, and I'm sure there's lots of people on here that have hopefully seen people that they would happily recommend to you. And I'll, I'll leave that with um, yourself and Kevin. To I was going to say, Kevin, is this something that we could we could work on? Maybe producing, I don't know, with with everyone's suggestions or something. Yeah, a, it is a, I, a I list think, or I something. Think, and I think Kelly's probably got a question coming up from Kayla soon about whether you can dip in and out of the NHS and get private consultations and about the cost of those. Um, we, we're probably going to end up doing something very politically incorrect as a support group, but we can do that and probably ask members to start nominating where they've had good experiences and just list those names. Um, I, I know, for example, I to me, one of the best in the world is Professor Peter Ray, who frequently presents uh, to our members. And I know since COVID, um, he now welcomes video consultations all around the world. But I do know that as a cost, and it's not just necessarily the cost of the consultation, it can then be the cost of follow-up tests, MRI scans, etc. But my personal view on it is we just shouldn't be in the position we're in with the NHS that we are. That's the reality. Um, and the other side to it 
it, and some people aren't aware of this, that it can cost less than now taking a family of four out for a meal in a restaurant to see a world-leading expert on bands conditions. Um, and I know when I was in the depths of despair with my condition, I'd much rather spend it on a consultant than a meal for four. Um, but that's a personal opinion. It's, I'm not saying it's right at all. And, and it, it's completely academic and pointless if you haven't got the money to pay for that. I understand that problem. Um, but I, I think we've got to start help by creating almost a directory, if we can, on, on our website, saying here are some names that other members have recommended. That's as far as we can go, because we, we can't start determining who's good and who's less good at, at doing their job. But it is, uh, honestly, what, one of the reasons for getting this group going was the pain I still suffer all the time, knowing there are people how I was many years ago, and there is no help. And all the GP says is, you'll, you'll be better in two weeks. It's a virus, and it's not a virus. That's how and we then, started. <laughs> yeah, we all do. We've all been there. And, and you do feel so alone and in the wilderness mm. because there's no one to turn to. And then if you do get a referral, you get a letter through saying, yes, in 84 weeks, you'll come and see us. And then in 82 weeks, you get another letter saying your appointment's been postponed. Um, so it goes on. So we are frustrated. We do as a group want to do everything we can, but we know we're not going to solve the huge problems the NHS have got. Um, but we've got to do what we can for, for our balanced immunity. So can, can, again, can I will just up again, and I, and I know Kelly's got that question coming oh, about. Costs. Yeah. Kelly, can you see the question? Yeah. You're on mute, You're Kelly. Mute. There we go. I'm, I'm sorted. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is just the last bit that um, to ask you, Michaela, before then we move on to something else for the meeting. Um, so the question is, is can I pay um, for private treatment for re rehabilitation and further treatment and still appointments that should happen towards the end of 2024 in the NHS system? So that's the first part. So and then the second part is um, we understand that costs of private consult consultations may vary, but what range or typical costs cost could I expect to pay for rehabilitation and treatment sessions? So certainly you can choose to go privately and, and seek um, consultation with doctors or for rehab um, prior to going into the, the NHS and, and still be on the waiting list for the NHS appointments. You wouldn't be able to, say, see a consultant on the NHS, then go and get tests done privately and then go back to see the consultant with those tests for the reports. Um, so you, you, can't, you can't chop and change between the two depending on, on kind of what, you, what you're doing. But you can certainly see someone privately and then go into the NHS when your NHS appointment comes through. Um, that is a, that's certainly a possibility, and I know lots of people do do that to get that diagnosis and to kind of make a start with their treatment. And, yeah, I quite understand how that works for people. Because, yeah, you, when you're struggling, you just need to have that diagnosis and, and know what you're dealing with and hopefully start dealing with it as soon as you're able to do so. Um, with regards to cost, it's going to vary massively on all sorts of factors, on what area you're in, what country you're in, who it is that you see, whether you're seeing a, a consultant, um, it's an ENT consultant, whether you're seeing someone like myself, a vestibular rehab, um, therapist, I'm a vestibular audiologist, there's vestibular physiotherapist, we do the same job but we come from different backgrounds. Um, so the costs will vary quite a lot. Um, I'm happy to share what I charge people for, for my appointments on the, on the private basis if, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, so I charge £60 for the 30 minute appointment session um, and I book things as they come. So I don't do things like block bookings where I say, right, I'll charge this amount for 
five sessions because I don't know how many sessions it's going to take. So I do things just one step at a time. And should you choose to see me to start your treatment program and then choose to leave it off and continue on with the NHS when that comes through and you, you're happy with that, that's fine. Michaela, if you don't mind just sharing your website as well, because um, you've got a, you're, you're the balance lady, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. www.thebalancelady.co.uk. Stick, stick it in the chat. Stick it in the oh, chat, please. See how I've... you asked me to do things with computers. I'm I know. With computers. That, thank you. Um, I, I think um, we, we're going to run out. Of we have run out of time in terms of uh, any more questions for now, uh, Kevin, because uh, we've got lots more coming up. Certainly do. Um, so thanks for that. That's part one with Michaela. We're, we're coming back to Michaela in about 10 minutes for part two. Um, so don't go away, folks, because we've got how to help your doctor to help you and things you might be able to do at home safely whilst waiting for an appointment. Um, but for now, we're going to meet two ladies who are i believe in the the throes of training to become um a michaela or similar um and these two ladies are students who have joined the meeting today and if everyone in this meeting now can listen carefully because they're going to talk through two different research projects that they are undertaking and often I hear from members, especially new members, we're good for nothing, we're useless, we can't do anything anymore. And this is completely untrue. And the one thing you're all good at is understanding balance conditions, whether you like it or not, we get very good at being experts on that. And what we can do is share that information. And these two research projects you're gonna hear about, there is a chance here for us to help um, these two ladies put together some great research, which is going to help overall our balance community. So as we go through it and you hear each of them explain what they're looking for, if you can, if you feel this is applicable to your experience, your situation, email me after this meeting or during the meeting to volunteer to join them. And now I'm going to try and find them in the gallery. And I think the first one to speak, am I correct? Is it Madeline? If you're there, Madeline, Katie. wait. Katie's first, sorry. I'll have to get that <laughs> right. I've got a 50 chance of getting that wrong. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Katie, it's over to you. If you explain what you're doing and yeah. where it fits in the scheme of things, and then we can hand over to your colleague after that. Over to yeah. you. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Um, and uh, me and Maddie just wanted to say thank you so much for letting us speak today. Um, it's really helpful coming here and hopefully we'll get some lovely volunteers for our research projects. Um, we're both doing the, the scientist training program. So it's a three year course. We spend 80% of our time in the hospital training to be um, clinical scientists in audiology. And we spend 20% of our time um, doing a part-time master's in neurosensory sciences. Um, and that's what this research project is for. I'm just gonna share my screen now. Hopefully it works. Um, one second. Let me know if you can see that. That's, that's perfect. It's coming through. Yeah, is it presenting? One second. I think it's just taking a while on my computer. Yeah, we're there. We can, we can see that. Slide. There we go. Perfect. So we're both students at the University of Manchester, um, and I'm being supervised by Debbie Kane, and Gabrielle Saunders. And my research is in self-concept in adults with chronic dizziness. I can click on to the next one. So um, an important question is what is self-concept? Um, and it is argued quite a lot in psychology, but for the purposes of this project, 
we're saying it's the individual's belief about themselves and their attributes um, and who and what the self is. Really, what it's asking is, who am I? Um, and it's made up of self-image, um, which is how you view yourself, self-esteem, which is how much value you feel you have, um, and the ideal self, which is what a person wishes they were like. Um, and this all sounds an awful lot like psychology, but I'm trying to bring it into balance and audiology. Um, and, and what has this got to do with dizziness, really? Um, and it's quite a lot. So it's widely accepted that people with chronic illnesses alter their self-concept over time, incorporating their illnesses and their experiences into who they are today. And, you know, this can be really positive. Um, it can help them come to terms with diagnosis, changing abilities, you know, who they really are now, different to who they might have been previously and who they might be in the future. Um, but it can also have some negative aspects. They might be hard on themselves, have poor self-esteem or negative self-image. But really, this is all speculation um, because there's no research into it. We don't actually know how people's self-concept is affected by chronic dizziness. So hopefully I'll be researching, um, doing some interviews with people um, about their experiences with self-concept and their dizziness and how they feel about it. So I'd really like some volunteers um, who are over 18, living in the UK. Sorry to anyone outside of the UK on this. Um, currently ongoing symptoms of dizziness um, for more than six months, which is how we're defining chronic. Um, and the dizziness to be of suspected or confirmed vestibular origin. So at the moment, we're still going through our ethical approval process. So we don't actually need anyone's names or details today. Um, let me come on here. Hopefully in a few months time when we've got the full approval, we'll send out another advert or hopefully come to another meeting. Um, and then if anyone wants to partake, we can send them an information sheet and a consent form. And if they'd still like to participate in the interview, um, we'll organize a little Zoom interview and it would just be with me or with Maddie and her research um, for about an hour just to speak about your experiences. So hopefully what will we get out of this? Well, we'd like to fill in some of the knowledge gaps around people's experiences with chronic dizziness. Um, and the outcomes of this is it might highlight other areas that we need to further research. If we can understand all the ways in which someone's affected by their dizziness, we can try and support and care for them in all these ways as well. You know, if we don't know it's a problem, we can't support them in that area. And hopefully it would be a good experience for you. Be cathartic, you'd be listened to, you'd have your say and you'd be contributing to research. You'd be doing your part for the advancement of the area. Hopefully we provide better understandings and outcomes for people with balance conditions in the future. So that's what my research is. Um, I'll see how to stop sharing there. Hopefully that's gone back on. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's lovely. Good. Um, and I'll pass it over on to Maddie and she can speak about more specifically her research. Thank Amazing. you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Katie. So just bear with me a moment, at, guys. I'm just sharing my screen, but I'm not very technologically minded, so we'll see how this goes. Right. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, hey, and we can see your and screen see. as well. Smashing. So, a um, little bit similar to Katie's project, mine is. Um, it's about exploring the lived experience of the significant others of people with chronic dizziness. So, hello, that's me. Um, and just like Katie, I'm an audiology trainee on the STP, doing my uh, master's in neurosensory science. Um, I'm actually quite new to audiology. I've not. I'm pretty new to this world of balance but I'm working with the fabulous Debbie Kane as well who is all things balance and she actually might be familiar to a few of you I think she'll be popping in as well with her own research over the course of the year um, so she's my main supervisor I'm also working with Gareth Prendergast and Sinead Munro who are my other supervisors as well so a bit of background to my project many many people suffer with chronic dizziness but it's just not that well understood um, and I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here a bit about you know, impact on quality of life. Today's just been a, you know, prime example of how it's got such far reaching impacts on your day to day, 
you know, you can have things like loss of self-identity, a bit sort of what Katie touched on, avoidance behaviours. There's been questions in, in the chat today about, you know, I can't do the things I would like to do. Um, psychological impacts and also a lack of understanding from other people. It can be really hard if you, you know, if people don't understand. It's an invisible illness. And there's so many more examples. You'll, ha you'll be able to think of your own. But having said all that, the research about the significant others of these people, it's just there's just not much out there, really. And why is that important? So significant others play such a vital role in supporting their partners with their chronic dizziness. I hope everyone here can can relate to that, that, you know, it's all about that support network around you. And without people to support you, it can be really, really tough. Um, so I said there's not much research out there already. The limited things that are out there, they're not UK based. Um, but what has been found is that significant others have just as diverse a lived experience as anyone with chronic dizziness do. Um, and that's important because being able to understand these experiences and get to the nitty gritty of how significant others experience a chronic illness is really the first step in being able to support this group. Um, and then in turn, being able to support them, support their partner. Um, and having them be meaningfully included in that healthcare journey rather than just sort of a spectator. So it's my casting call. So calling all significant others of people who have chronic dizziness. And just the same as with Katie, just to reiterate that that's kind of, we're defining that as just ongoing symptoms for the last six months or more. Um, and you must be over 18 living in the UK. Um, and what will it involve? So it will be a semi-structured interview held by a video call about Sort of 30 to 60 minutes we'll just work around whatever timing works for you and what it will be is just a real chance to talk about you and as a significant other and every way in which your partner's dizziness affects you personally in your day-to-day -day. Um, and then at the end I'm going to be kind of collecting all of these interviews together and having a good analysis and seeing what themes we get out and maybe what kind of common experiences people have as well and just to mention your name will be anonymous in that final manuscript. So please be as completely brutally honest as you'd like to be. It really is a chance to just get your story out there. Yeah. So what are the benefits of taking past? Katie hit the nail on the head. I mean, we need, this is such an under researched area in general, anything vestibular is. So it will be a chance to have your say and really bring some more attention and, um, you know, further that knowledge base in an under researched um, area and also shedding light on a kind of underrepresented population. I hope you guys, you know, can agree with me when I say I feel like significant others are sort of the unsung heroes sometimes, friends, friends and families, and they get a little bit overlooked. So we need to make sure that they're having their say as well. Um, so it would be an opportunity to tell your story, and that's, that's all it is. I just want to hear everything that you have to say, and you can really be heard. Um, and again, it's a chance to take part in research and just further the field. So like Katie said, we've not got our ethics approval yet. So watch this space. Um, it'll be sometime later this year, probably around summertime. So just keep an eye out. So I'll be popping in and out of future meetings, ideally, if, if we're allowed back. And, you know, we'll be having adverts on social media, on the website, newsletters, all these things. So in the meantime, hopefully I've kind of got your interest a little bit. So speak to your partners or if you're a partner in this meeting today, have a think um and just keep an eye out if it's something you'd be interested in in participating in so thanks and if there's any questions for myself or katie by all means ask away and we'll answer as best we can thanks. i think there i think there is one already um maddie is significant other uh, a partner or can it be a parent that you live with so that's an excellent question so this is one of those things which i'm sort of trying to really decide on as far as i'm concerned i think it's just as valid to hear from you know non-romantic significant others as you know a, a t your, your typical spouse or whatever um so as, at the moment yes it could be a parent it could be a, you know some really i'm sort of imagining so, so imagining someone you would live with or someone who spends your time with versus say a friend who you see maybe once a week that wouldn't quite be what i'm looking for but um more to come on that watch this space brilliant now that's lovely thanks to both of you there um and obviously when you have got the go ahead uh do let us know and say you either come into uh the next applicable meeting or we'll, we'll advertise it um but to all the members out there and anyone watching this on video next week 
if you ever get a chance to participate in these things, do it. Because if we don't help ourselves, no one else is going to. So the more people who can participate, the better. One question I'd got, which wasn't clear that I started on my journey almost 20 years ago. Um, technically, I've still got many heirs, but am I the sort of person you're looking for who's had this thing for so long? Because I, I can probably, well, my, my significant partner, my wife, would tell you I've been through multiple personality stages and, and <laughs> it depends. Now you're talking to me at this age, my view is very different to what it was 20 years ago. But do I qualify or will I qualify? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, well, always my mind is speaking that. Um, so if you've been, have you experienced dizziness in the last six months really is what we'd like to say. And if it's been going on for a really long time, then I think we'd definitely say that was chronic dizziness. Yeah, yeah brilliant. That's good. But uh, I really do hope you get the go ahead and uh, we can help you both. Yeah, and just and to it's sort good of um, people coming sorry. into this as well. We we need lots of people like you, so don't give up. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Just to sort of add on to what Katie was saying, there, you know, it, it's absolutely you're absolutely right. You know, the different people will have different lengths of time that they've been dealing with this condition, either as the person who has it or as a significant other following along on that journey, and we're interested in, to hear it all you know as valid as varied and valid an experience as possible so absolutely you don't have to be sort of new and fresh to to still have your story told and you've got also that benefit of having that experience and you can see that sort of change over time and that would be really interesting for us to hear about as well super lovely thanks very much you guys so we we are back to part two with Michaela so Michaela, get ready to unmute. And we are now going to have a little, little short presentation from Michaela on how we can help the doctors to help us, which is going to be very, very interesting, given what we were discussing earlier. So over to you, Michaela, please. I'm just finding a thing to... There with me. There you go. Yeah, that's working. There we go. Sorry, I'm just finding the right. So I'm having slight technical issues with the, the slide show. That's good. I think we're on page one. <laughs> Is that? Sorry, just it's... I So I'm just trying to get the slideshow working so I can see it properly. Yeah, that's yeah. There we go. Is that still showing on your screens? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Um, start on the right slide, though. Sorry, this is why I don't work with computers as much as I as I can. And I'd just like to say to to Maddie and Katie how pleased I am to have you here today. It's really, really good to to have more people coming into vestibular work. And I can honestly tell you that the vestibular side is absolutely the best bit to specialise in audiology. So it's, it's great. Keep going. But to bring you to, to actually just hopefully a very, very brief um, slideshow for you, I've sectioned it into two parts, the how to help your doctor to help you and also how to help your vestibular therapist to help you. Now, the reason I've done this is there's, there's nothing out there that I found that kind of helps guide you into what information we're needing from you to be able to help you as best as we can, which we desperately want to do. Part of the difficult thing with dealing with balance issues is that they are so complex that they can take quite a lot of time. And with the appointment durations that often we give them, particularly in the NHS, our appointment times are very short. So we need to try and get as much good information as quickly as we can. So I'm, I just wanted to do this for you to 
kind of give you some brief guidelines as to what to expect that the information they're needing from you um, and to also give you the chance to be able to take a bit of time before you go to these appointments to consider what your answers to them are so you can get your information to them as much as you need to as well. Now, one of the key things I would like to say is being as specific as you can. Um, the more specific information we can get, we can cover a lot more in a shorter period of time. Um, and seeing somebody that, as I've said before, that specialises in dizziness, vestibular issues, is so important. You'll bypass a lot of the difficulties of kind of going over the same things with a whole variety of people if you're able to see somebody that vestibular issues are their thing. And again, I know that is an awful lot easier said than done, but hopefully with these guidelines that I'm going to give you, it will help your potentially your GP to signpost you into the right positions. And the appointments are two-way communications. It's not just about what the specialist asks you, also what you can convey to the specialist. And the biggest thing is that the word dizzy absolutely means different things to different people. So try and be as descriptive as you can to explain a feeling. And I know how hard it is to explain a feeling, but I say dizzy can mean feeling of lightheadedness or heavy headedness. It can be feeling that the world is spinning around you. It can feel like you're just not quite within the environment that you're within. It can be that it's when you move, things seem to catch up. All of these different feelings can be encompassed by the word dizzy but all of those things can be caused by different things and can suggest to the doctor kind of what direction they may be thinking of sending you so try really really hard to define what you mean by the word dizzy when you're speaking to them and saying the word dizzy let them know exactly what you mean as best as you can there are particular things that the doctor is going to need to know about your issues and it can be quite a wide variety of things so try and be as specific as you can it's it's nice to be able to chat to people but in a very short appointment when you've got say 15 minute spot to try and get as much information as you can being given the whole description of the holiday that then led to a week later the dizziness started kind of takes up a lot of time without you actually getting kind of any benefit for it try and keep your answers really specific and really descriptive so you can convey what you're feeling but try and keep your answers as short as you can as well but it is really important to list all of the things that you've noticed so absolutely tell us about the the feelings of imbalanced dizziness um the the lightheadedness but if you're also noticing that your hearing doesn't seem to be quite what it was please mention that as well if you notice that actually there's a ringing noise in your ears mention that it's really important if you're noticing things like um you've got a a strange sensation just on one side of the head but you can also see zigzag lines mention it try not to necessarily just focus on the i'm dizzy and i want the dizziness approach if there's other things going on that's happening around the same kind of time make a note of it so you remember to mention it hopefully the doctors would ask you lots of these things anyway but if you're seeing somebody that their speciality is not that or potentially the gp Having all of this information given to them can make it an awful lot easier for them to actually understand what's going on. And let us know how long does these feelings last for. Although we understand that your, your balance issue is ongoing, is the actual feeling of that movement, for example, does it last for seconds? Does it last for minutes? Is it going on for hours without stopping? Is it going on for days and days? These kinds of things can help us pinpoint what's likely to be happening. 
and how often is it happening is it many times during the day or is it only maybe a couple of times a month but keeps coming every few months again it can give us a good idea of what the diagnosis may pointy, uh, be pointing towards and therefore help us do so um, more effectively are you able to make a notice um, uh, uh, what's the word can't this are you able to mention it whether it's particular movements or places or situations that bring your symptoms on what we're not asking for is for you to be able to say this is why i feel this but for example it's very common as i'm sure many of you are aware that with um certain difficulties with your balance things like walking past railings or walking through lines of trees where the sunlight's shining through can trigger those feelings of imbalance let us know these things because again it gives a good idea of what's actually happening if you're able to give examples of what you're doing when the symptoms come on rather than necessarily trying to tell us why the symptoms have come on then we can put all the pieces of the pants together make a list if you can of all the medications you're taking also where possible make a note of what dose you're taking and potentially what they're prescribed for as well you'll also hopefully be asked if there's any blood relations or family history of any ear balance or neurological conditions and by family history we do mean blood relation not your cousin's brother-in-law's aunt is experiencing something the same because obviously that's not going to cause a difficulty or a potential hereditary issue with yourself and then we can start to get a little bit more expansive of the story of what your difficulties are when did your symptoms very first start and what happened at that time what were the symptoms how long did they last basically all the the key points that i've mentioned before where were you what were you doing at the time being able to make a, a, a just a list of these things can just help you be able to convey it in a really efficient manner and importantly how have the symptoms changed have they been exactly the same as they were the first time on repeated occasions have things changed for the better but you're still having difficulties or are they getting progressively worse and in which way what way are they different and what's the difficulties you're having at this moment in time or this week or what's brought you to your doctor your consultant about these difficulties at this point is it that they've just started or is it that you've had it for 20 years but it's been perfectly okay and things have been manageable but things are now not for whatever reason and please we're always perfectly happy for you to have a list of questions that you're wanting to ask so that you remember to ask them because it's so easy to get into what's a stressful situation and to not remember all the questions that you were wanting to ask and, and you get home and think oh i've forgotten to do this and I, I wish i'd asked them that and then having the rigmarole of trying to make contact to ask the questions at a later date so those are kind of the basics of what you're looking for and what the, the doctors are looking for the answers in that that first appointment um, to see them to hopefully point us towards an accurate diagnosis as early on as we can and therefore then treat you in the best way that we can from there but that then brings us to the rehab side of things now i understand a lot of you obviously have already seen plenty of doctors and you're past that point and you're now in the rehab side of things and again there's certain key things that we're going to ask you or hopefully we're going to ask you and that if you're prepared for what questions we're likely to ask you'll have that information already with you so we can again make the best use of the time that we have um, to do things as best as we can for you and have the best outcomes so certainly from my side of things when i first see people i like to know who they've seen previously and when is it that the gp has prescribed um sorry has diagnosed you and how good is that diagnosis 
the when was it that you've been seen? Was it you again seen some twenty years ago, but things are more difficult now, but you haven't seen anybody on all, all that time? Or is it a direct referral from a consultant to me that I I know? And um, what have they told you? What the diagnosis you've been given, what information have they given you or what advice have they given you? Um, just so I know kind of where we're starting, whether you've had exercises before and if so, what exercises? Um, and it gives me an idea of kind of what direction we can move on from. So I'm not telling you exactly the same things as you've already done and able to kind of move forward rather than kind of going over the same grounds that you've potentially already gone over. And again, what I want to know is what movements, places or situations can bring your symptoms on. Again, I'm not looking for why do they make you feel bad. I just want to know what examples of what you're doing when those symptoms come on, because sometimes it's easier for me to see what the pattern is as to what's triggering the feelings of imbalance than when you're in it and kind of you're you're just experiencing that dizziness and not necessarily realising what it is that's, that's brought it on. And what's the difficulties that you're having at the present time? What is it that you want to work on at the moment? And what is it that you need to achieve? So is it that you particularly struggle working on screens and your workplace involves a lot of computer work that we can work on that, that side of things potentially more um, than being able to walk out and about if that's not something you're needing to focus on? It's all about trying to do what's best for you each step of the way. Again, are your symptoms same, better or any worse than they have been, either from seeing the consultant or the doctor or in between our appointments? Are the exercises that I'm giving you helping? Are they helping in the right way? And where do we need to go from there by working out what difficulties you're having at that moment? A big one for balance issues. It's a normal response to avoid things that make you feel bad. It's your brain's way of trying to protect you. And it's a normal response because if you ate something that made you violently sick, well, that's your body's way of telling you potentially that's dangerous. Don't do it. It's harmful. You touch something and burn yourself. It's your brain's way of telling you don't do it again. It's potentially dangerous and harmful. So it does the same thing with the feelings of dizziness. It's a very unpleasant sensations your brain tells you don't do it it's potentially harmful so we get a lot of stiff necks and stiff movement because moving your head feels dizzy so don't do it is there certain environments that you avoid going into because of your dizziness again all of these things will give us information as to what the pattern is as to what's triggering the balance and what we can therefore work our exercises around to hopefully make things better. And what kind of things do you enjoy doing? I want to know these things that you like to do so that we can get you doing things that you enjoy doing again in whatever way we can. Um, and to encourage you to find things that you enjoy doing and hopefully also bring these things into the exercises so the exercises are hopefully slightly less frustrating and dull as they could potentially be without doing things you enjoy. Do you have any other health conditions or injuries that can impact on your mobility or your activities? We need to know things like if you've got a bad back and you can't move in certain ways because of your back, because obviously then that can imp influence what kind of exercises is practical for me to give to you. Um, if you've got peripheral neuropathy, for example, you can't feel the sensation in your feet, that will have an impact on balance as a whole and there will be limitations and that's something we would also need to look at. So this kind of information, really, really helpful. And again, make a note of any questions that you have. I'm more than happy for you to come in with a sheet with itemised questions and go through each question I want to help you. I want to answer the questions that you have for you to have all the information that you need and that you want and to give you that reassurance as to things that you may not have had the answers to previously. So 
as I say, that's kind of the basic essential items that hopefully you will be asked and having that prior knowledge of them. And I was mentioned to Kevin, I'm going to sort out a, hopefully a printable sheet that you can print off so you can write your responses to these questions in so you can take it to whatever appointment you go to and hopefully give them that extra information that will hopefully help them come to a more focused approach to where to send you or how to help you in the best way and, and do it as efficiently as, as we can for both sides. Lovely, Michaela, that's brilliant. I, I did put in the chat while you were talking, um, I'm going to share a copy of your presentation as a PDF to all the members. I'll email a link um, early next week. And then, a, as a I say... Bits, sorry, there's a few bits that I've left out of the the presentation there because there was too much information. Yes, for, yeah. For too small a period. And Andrew Hugels very helpfully just mentioned about the, the spectrum that he's done with Professor Ray, and that's fantastic as well. That's really, really helpful. Well, I was going to say, what, what we'll do as soon as you get, get those magical few moments, we'll, um, we'll probably put up a new web page on our website that deals with this whole subject, um, where you could download your crib list then um, in the future. So that would be great. But it, it's really useful hearing from someone like yourself of what you need to hear from from us, the patient, is, is invaluable. And and we did mention before the meeting that, that it's so difficult when you're in this state of shock, confusion, and all the rest of it, like all the baggage that goes with the balance condition. It's really difficult to prepare for any meeting with a doctor and, and be thinking straight. So thanks ever so much for that. That's great. Now, we've got one final request of you, Michaela. Um, and I know we've touched upon some of this with the questions earlier. And it, it's all about, and it's a really difficult one, but many, many members are coming on in the last year saying, what do I do? Uh, in some cases, they haven't even got a diagnosis, but they don't know when they're going to access any consultation, any treatment. I guess it's easier if they've already got a diagnosis and then they're waiting to receive treatment. That's slightly easier. But the big question is, I am stuck at home. I've got these problems. What can I do to reduce the symptoms of my dizziness or help myself in some way before the treatment? Now, I know it's a complex answer. I'm going to leave you with this. But if, spend as long as you want. Just talk us through different scenarios because there are all sorts of different cases out there listening to you. Um, and I know it's an impossible question to answer but we get asked this every other week what can i do while i'm waiting to see an expert so over to you yeah this is a question that we could spend hours on <laughs> there's this so many different things i'll start off with if you've got a diagnosis tackling each thread is the important thing so not everything is treated in the same way. So for example, things like menias, so that's treated with suitable medication as required to help with the attacks. Dietary modification can be very beneficial for this also. So low salt, low sodium diet um, and no caffeine. Notice no, not low caffeine. So cutting out coffee, tea, um, potentially hot chocolate, um, Coca-Cola, those kinds of things really help some people. Not everybody, but it can be really, really helpful. Low salt, low sodium, it's not no salt because that's not good for you either. You need some salt in your diet, but trying to keep it as low as you can. And I'm afraid that's a lot of packet watching. So if you pick up two cans of beans, look up on their salt or sodium levels and try and go for the lowest one try not to add it at the table and in cooking as, as much as you can um rehab can help with many as 
in between the attacks if there's imbalance in between. Those are kind of the three things for many as disease. Migraine, that's that's a whole, again, a whole several hours worth of, of things that we could talk about with migraine. Um, suitable medication as required. Medication falls into two categories. It falls into ones that you take on a daily basis as a preventative measure. And there's ones that you take as and when symptoms start to kick in. And in both of those categories, there's a whole variety of different medications. It's absolutely trial and error of finding the right one that suits you. So if you try something and it doesn't suit you for whatever reason, have a chat to the doctor again about trying something different. Um, again, with migraine, there's the dietary modification. And I really apologize every time I tell people this because we absolutely take out all the good stuff. For the next couple of months is my advice that you cut these things out completely. But you can then start reintroducing things, but you've got to give it at least a couple of weeks, preferably a bit more. So you don't inadvertently overlap because a migraine trigger can cause a response 72 hours later sometimes. So you can have three days difference between something you've potentially eaten or whatever other trigger and the symptoms start to kick in. But the key things from the migraine exclusion diet, cheese, any form of it, block, on pizza, in a vegetable sauce, any form of it. So cheese, chocolate, citrus fruits, and that's oranges, lemons, limes, and grapefruits. And again, it's any form of it. It's the fruit, it's the juice, it's the zest of it in a cake, any form. Chinese food, and it's it's the Chin uh, sorry, it's the MSG in Chinese food. But we, we say it's Chinese food because it's the five C's. It makes it a, a lot easier for us to remember the, the components of the diet. So MSG, and that's in a variety of other things. So again, packet watching, I'm afraid, or cooking from crap, uh, from scratch yourself. Um, cheese, chocolate, caffeine, Chinese food. And I always forget the fifth. Is it red wine? That's red wine. There's another C. Oh. It'll come to me in a minute and I'll kick myself for not remembering it. It'll come to me later. But those are the big ones. Stress is a big trigger for a lot of people. It's For most people, it's an increase in stress levels. For some of us, it's a decrease in stress levels, which I think is just rude because that tends to be noticeable. Weekends, holidays, any time you do something you enjoy and the headache starts or the dizziness starts. But yeah, that's a potential trigger. Too much sleep, not enough sleep. Broken sleep can trigger it for some people. Weather changes can trigger it for some people. If you're able to identify a trigger, fantastic. It can make things easier in that it gives you that information to work with. So if you identify, say, chocolate as a trigger for you, but you really love chocolate, then we're not saying, or I'm not saying, you have to cut this out completely forevermore because... We want to live a life we enjoy. Sometimes it is just worth it, but it's knowing what the consequences are. So say, if you particularly like chocolate, knowing that, yes, you can have chocolate, but it's going to cause you issues. So trying to time it to a time where it's not going to impact on, say, doing something really important at work or you've got something going on with the kids that's really important to them. You don't eat your chocolate just before that and trigger response that way. Just having that informed um, decision-making to the consequences of it. Um, thank you very much for all the people that are adding in the, the triggers for the, for the migraine. Um, yes, yeah, so the medication, dietary modification, lifestyle changes, to, if you're particularly stress-induced, trying to keep stress levels down and tackling that side of things. Um, vestibular rehab can be helpful with balance issues with migraine as long as it's not triggering migraines. 
in which case you need to get the migraines fully under control before we can do much with the exercises. But it doesn't trigger it for everybody, so it's worth trying gently with, with suitable advice. So that's many as a migraine. BPPV is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. This is the dizziness where you lie down in bed, roll over, and the world starts having a little spin, or you feel like you're being sucked down into the mattress, or you look up to pull the curtains and you feel dizzy, or you go to the dentist and you lie back. So going back to the presentation I, I made about the listing the things of situations, places, movements that you experience the dizziness, it makes my day when somebody comes in and says, oh, I don't know what it is, but every time I go to the dentist, I'm very dizzy. Thank you very much. I can pretty much diagnose you just from that. But yeah, so BPPV sometimes can be helped with something called the Brandt Darrell exercises. That's only helpful if there's just a few of the calcium crystals loose within the balance system in the ear. So it can be helpful for some, not for others. So if you do it and it makes you feel awful, don't bother with them. It's not going to help. If it's manageable and you're getting benefit from it, fantastic. But the Epley manoeuvre or the Seamont manoeuvre, you need somebody to, to do that with you. Um, either some GPs are able to do it or a consultant or rehab therapist. There'll be, there's a variety of people that can help you with that. Just find someone that can do it properly. Um, so that's BPPV. Purely vestibular issues, so things like what we would term as a vestibulopathy or a generalised vestibular deficit, a weakness within the balance system in the ears, vestibular rehab exercises, keeping active and mobile as you can and trying to just pace yourself with your activity. As I say, avoiding moving and doing as little as you can to because of avoidance isn't going to help. It's not going to give your brain the chance to work out what's going on and adjust for it. I know it's really, really hard to do the things that feel bad because it's absolutely counterintuitive and your brownie brain is absolutely telling you don't do it because it's threatening. But with guidance, it's important that you move. So as I say, even if it's just you're sitting and just moving your head a little bit because that's all you can just about manage, that's fine. But keep doing it and gradually increase your activity as you're able to and as long as you are safe to do so. So I spotted somebody mentioned about with the exercises, things like cycling is really helpful for them. Fantastic. Please don't go cycling down a canal path. It's, it's, yeah, that, that brings my stomach up to my heart when people, when people are kind of, yeah, don't cycle down the canal path or go swimming in the sea and these kinds of things for exercise. Do things in a safe and sensible manner. Um, if you've not, so those are kind of the biggest diagnosis with purely vestibular issues. Obviously, migraine is not purely vestibular, but that's not obviously including any other kind of neurological issues that people may have or other physical um, health issues that people may have. For those without a diagnosis, again, it's the trying to keep as active and as mobile as you can safely do so. The kind of the key exercise to start with, with the vestibular rehab is the VOR exercise, the vestibular ocular reflex, which is what your ears are telling your brain to do with your eyes. Now this one, anyone can do, and it doesn't have any adverse impact to anything, but can potentially be very helpful for you. But please don't prevent yourself from getting a diagnosis if you've done some exercises and things are improved please still get a diagnosis but so the VOR exercise you could do this either with your thumb or it's any stationary object but the item that you're looking at has got to be stationary and I know a lot of you will be very familiar with this already but it's focusing on that one thing keeping your eyes absolutely locked on it and turning your head now it's quite a short movement but it's a definite movement. If you go too far, it's not going to remain in focus because 
the outer eye will actually end up looking at your nose rather than what you're focused on. Both eyes must be focused on that one thing and just turning your head. The best way I've found to describe to people that then gets this done correctly is if you stare at it and imagine it's asked to borrow a huge amount of money and you know full well it has no intention of giving it back to you and you're selling it absolutely not. You are not giving it all that money. That generally gets people completely locked on that one thing and a nice steady no movement. That is the best thing that you can make a start on to kind of start the process of your, your vestibular system starting to retune a little. It's not going to solve everything at all. It's a starting point, but it's something that you can do in the meantime before you see anybody for a diagnosis. But do get a diagnosis. And that's kind of a... a a short overview of a very, very large subject. <laughs> Brilliant, Michaela. And apologies for that unanswerable question, but you... I would also, sorry, I'm just going to jump in there. Add in things like Tai Chi, Yoga, Pilates. You can see, you can find all sorts of those online. There's all sorts of classes. Things like yoga, you might be, need to be careful with things where you're kind of bending down or putting your head down. But there's lots of things that are on a more horizontal plane where you can do it sitting in an armchair or even sitting in bed and doing some of these movements. That's really helpful. And as I say, those three things are brilliant for vestibular issues, brilliant physically, mentally, covers a, a lot of things and mindfulness, whatever it is that helps your brain just have a bit of a break and dealing with everything else, just have that space to just breathe. Again, it's really, really beneficial. It's often something that's very much overlooked. We want to kind of focus on the, the practicality of dealing with an issue. But mindfulness in whatever form, and there's a whole variety. It's not just kind of sitting in a quiet room and sitting with your eyes closed, all that kind of thing. Anything that helps your brain just tune out really, really does help. And then I'll, I will leave it there. I think we've got a question John has got his hand. If you want to unmute John and uh, just give us your question or comment. Yeah, uh, thanks, Michaela, very much for what you said. It, everything just completely falls into place. Um, my question is... Um, I have bilateral vestibular failure. They've just said it's almost total toll. That's the that's the diagnosis to be given. One of the problems I struggle with is is cognitive issues, um, multitasking, um, trying to sometimes get my words out, um, especially if I'm walking or doing anything. Is there any um, cognitive um, Therapy, like I don't know, crosswords, Sudoku that would help, do you know. The difficulty that you have, so the bilateral vestibular failure, as I mentioned before, balance as a whole is your vestibular function, visual information, full muscular skeletal system, and your brain deals with all that information. It deals with it subconsciously, so it doesn't have to put much thought or effort into it when it's working well. If it's not working so, quite so well, it can be brought up to a more conscious level, which takes a lot of concentration. In the nicest way, our, our um, conscious part of the brain can only deal with so much. And it's in your situation, because you've not got that vestibular information, your brain is relying on your visual and your, your body, and it's, it's missing all of your vestibular information. It's having to put a lot more work into it to try and overcome the deficit in the vestibular system it's brought to a more conscious level which is why the cognitive side of things is so much more difficult your brain is having to do a lot of work in a part of it but it's not its job so it's having to put a lot more thought into it it's doing kind of at least twice the workload 
and that's tiring. And the more tired it is, the more difficult it is to work with, the more mistakes it makes, and therefore the more work it's then got to do. And it all kind of just spirals until you go to sleep and, and you wake up and go through the process again, unfortunately. It's, again, it's going to be kind of a case of not overloading your brain with information. Multitasking is absolutely going to be very difficult. And where possible, trying to kind of section things out so you're not trying to do things all at once. Um, things like, I mean, dark things like writing things down as to what you're needing to do or to remember during the day. So you're not having to constantly think, I've got to remember this and I've got to remember that. Kind of take that little bit of information out of your brain so it has got to add that into its capacity. And kind of planning from that what activity that you're going to spend that time on to do. Um, so seeing potentially seeing someone that can help you find ways of adjusting how you go about things to kind of increase that capacity in its most efficient way would probably be the direction I'd be going. Thank you very much. Just a quick bit of information for you about the otolopsia. Had it for three years now, and although it isn't cured uh, by any means, it's always there. Uh, and I know three or four people with similar condition. It doesn't go away, but you get used to it being there. Uh, but you don't cure it. I've tried all the exercise, believe me, because it's the it's the one of the worst things you have to deal with. Uh, so you know, if you could magic that away. That, that would be ace. But, yeah, so just some information for you anyway. But thank you very much, and I appreciate it. Lovely. Yeah, thanks, John. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michaela. Um, we have to come to the end now. We, uh, As well as having those virtual hand signs on my Zoom, I get virtual cross-leg signs coming up, and after two hours, we've got to, we've got to finish. We could go on for hours more. Michaela, another brilliant session from you thank you so much um you know we all appreciate this is your own free time you give to this after spending each week helping many people professionally so it's been really really good to to hear everything from you um and hopefully we'll hear a lot more from you in the future as well but thanks for everything you've done today uh, it's been really useful and i'll talk to you next week about how we're going to get that crib sheet to all the members um very quickly now guys for all of you because i know we've, we've all got to get on just a couple of last second announcements um the next meeting will be uh saturday 20th of april we'll be very honored we've got the exec director of vida vida many of you will know it's vestibular.org it is a brilliant resource uh, for anyone with bands conditions. We've got the top lady who runs it is going to talk to us uh, Saturday, April 20th. Before then, and I will email you all next week, I'm going to nag every one of you. Can you share your story? Can you either commit to video on your smartphone or type it out and email it over? We, we One of the big things from last year's members survey, you love to hear other people's stories because it, it just validates everything you're going through. You can relate to it and it helps so many people who are new to balanced conditions to understand this is normal. So really will be a big push to get as many videos, as many stories, and there's no such thing as a bad story or insignificant story. We've all got our own take on what we're going through. So it really is important to share that. Um, one other thing, my old hobby horse here, we have something called member to member contact group where you can opt in to share your first name and email address and link up, connect to other members between our six meetings a year. Again, that will be on the next email of how you do them. And if you're not in it, do consider joining. 
is you'll you'll meet some amazing people, people just like you, and have friendships for the rest of your life. But thanks, everyone. Thank you, RuPaul, Kelly again, another brilliant job. Um, thanks to our two students as well for sharing what they're doing. And we're, we're all for this people coming in to to this profession and, and helping our band's community. So thank you, everyone. It's been a long one today, but can't wait till the next one in April. There's no such thing as a daft question. So anyone who's still got questions, email me or the band's buddies. Just, you know, let's get talking. Let's get busy helping each other. And I assure you, we all do get to a better place. It's a marathon, not a sprint, but we are going to get there and we're going to help you as much as we can. So thanks ever so much. All take care. See you in April. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye-bye.